Oh, hello. Sorry. War. We love it, right? Blowing stuff up, watching people suffer and die. It's exciting. I mean, violence, domination, retribution, and other attributes of this competitive, warring fascination clearly dominates our media, with films, television, and other expressions constantly glorifying and reinforcing this gesture of conflict. In fact, it has been found that by the time an average kid reaches the age of 14 in the West, he or she has visually witnessed over 8,000 depicted acts of murder. So given all of this, it might make you wonder, does art imitate life, or does life imitate art? Likewise, isn't it interesting how most of us in America sleep quite well at night, while our military forces routinely invade, slaughter, and steal from other nations at will? As, of course, all global empires have done historically. With this time a global civilian death toll well over one million in the past decade alone, many of them women and children, and yet the same American culture shudders in horror and confusion when some dude stumbles into an American schoolyard and randomly wipes out a couple dozen or so kids. I ask you, by what measure do we differentiate importance when it comes to the death of different groups of people? What makes us so special? While history is certainly full of xenophobic, racist, religious, and nationalist conceits, which have served as convenient justifications for external dehumanization, subjugation, and imperial power abuse, a rather unnoticed yet profound scientific truth has also emerged. Today, every person on Earth can trace his or her lineage back to a single common female ancestor who lived about 200,000 years ago or so. Mitochondrial Eve, she is now called, proving indeed that we are truly one family. Likewise, the planet Earth, the habitat this family shares, it knows no division. It is a unified, synergistic system at every turn, fully connected. It has no idea what a nation or a politician or a racist is. It has no notion of any such human conceit for that matter, for division simply doesn't exist in the order of nature by which we are all invariably subject. Mark Twain once wrote, Man is the only patriot. He sets himself apart in his country under his own flag and sneers at the other nations, and keeps multitudinous uniformed assassins on hand at heavy expense to grab slices of other people's countries and keep them from grabbing slices of his. And in the intervals between campaigns, he washes the blood off his hands and works for the universal brotherhood of man with his mouth. You know, while we all love to give lip service to the idea of peace and collaboration, holding up icons such as Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., something underneath the surface is clearly holding us back. Yes, we know for a fact that if we took the total war budgets of all the nations on Earth, tens of trillions of dollars over the past quarter century alone, and applied that energy-producing capital towards creating an advanced, intelligent, efficient system of Earth human management, not only would poverty and most deprivation be removed from our lives on the global scale, our progressive capacity to create, build, and improve, rather than pillage, seek, and destroy, could catapult the human family into an age of prosperity never before seen. Just imagine, if we took, say, America's Pentagon, or Britain's Northwood, along with all the world's advanced military centers, kicked all the army freaks out, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be harsh. I guess we have to do something with them. Maybe we can just take them all and place them in the Grand Canyon, and just let them beat the piss out of each other, and hopefully they'll get it out of their systems and move on. I don't know, we'll figure that out later. But we, as the intelligent, mature human family, now interested in improving the lives of all, we use that incredible technology to help assist true developmental progress. Imagine if the Manhattan Project, which harnessed about 130,000 people, mostly scientists and technicians, was dedicated not to building a bomb that could destroy on a scale never before seen, but rather utilizing that collaborative drive to solve true global problems. Perhaps those very problems, in fact, which are causing the interest in war to begin with. 
Today, the hyper-glorified, romanticized obsession with competition, advantage, and conflict has made it into almost every facet of our lives. Not only do we declare war against virtually everything that annoys us, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on terrorism, the war on cancer, you name it. We also, apart from the near constant nationalist wars, live in a perpetual state of common war or class war, where we battle each other on a daily basis for unnecessary economic survival and delusions of status. The fact is, something has been set in motion that keeps us all on a multi-level warpath. Something in our psychology and hence sociology is constantly pushing us into justifications of these patterns. And as this episode will argue, that something appears to reside at the very foundation of the socioeconomic condition itself. A foundation which has given rise to an ever-expanding, destructive neuroses, a neuroses clearly characteristic of a culture in decline. This just in, the president has finished an emergency session at the White House where he announced that the security focus of his administration will be moving away from the global war on terror, instead focusing all available resources against something the administration has deemed a larger threat to U.S. and international security than anything recognized before, nature itself. That's right, Dutch. The newly declared war against nature will be usurping funds from the Department of Homeland Security, effectively replacing it with a new department, the Department of... I think I'm reading this right. Fuck the earth and the science it rode in on. That's correct, Summer. The administration has already appointed a head to this new department, the CEO of Monsanto Corporation, Satan himself. When questioned regarding concerns about a possible conflict of interest of the new appointee, the Obama administration responded, Monsanto's reputation of challenging the vast power of this intolerant bullying force that goes by the terrorist name natural science holds great potential for our victory. We feel if anyone can take down these insurgent laws which restrict our God-given freedom, it is the professional experience of our true Lord and Master, the Prince of Darkness. Uh, we've just been informed that a press conference is now underway with the Pentagon spokesperson answering questions. We now go live to the White House. As the President said earlier, the greatest barrier to U.S. interest has been a constant state of offensive interference by this rogue network. Nature has been forcing its will against our freedom for long enough. Our economy, our values, the American way of life, it's not negotiable. Either nature concedes to our interests and stops terrorizing us with its hatred of our liberty, or we will be forced to destroy it. Next question. Hi, Joe from LA Times. Uh, don't you feel it could be a bad idea to move against a force which has historically never been overcome or even phased by human action? Also, I understand nature has given a set of demands which, if met, would cease many of its counterattacks. Has the administration considered just meeting these demands? Listen, Joe, we don't negotiate with terrorists. And yeah, I've seen nature's demands, full of queer communist propaganda such as balance and sustainability. It even demands that we shut down our infinite growth consumption economy to make way for something where we are to be slaves to some oppressive natural regeneration respect. Listen. I didn't spend 35 years defending this country to have some metaphysical terrorist group with science on its side ruin what has made this nation great. No further questions. When we think of war, we usually think about gun-wielding soldiers, tanks, flamethrowers, fancy metal honors, and other theatrics. Yet when we step outside the theater, Digging deeper in our examination of the world around us, we find that war is actually a state of mind, a reaction driven by some type of competitive condition. And if we had to classify the different levels of large-scale competition, we might end up with two broad categories, imperial war and class war. 
Imperial War, otherwise known as National War, is when an aggressor nation decides to invade some other nation justified by some form of perceived threat. Back in the day, this threat often appeared as purely ideological, with religious groups battling it out to make sure they were in good with God. While in the mildly more literate scientific world today, the threat is more often than not pitched as direct to each of us. You know, such as say, a rogue nation getting a nuclear weapon to blow up your grandmother's bingo tournament. Bingo. Or perhaps a crazed, state-funded hijacker crashing a plane into your favorite taco stand. Regardless, in virtually every historical case, the justification for war put forward for public digestion has always been far from the truth. You see, there is indeed always a true threat, but that threat has little to do with the vast majority of the population. Instead, it is a threat that bothers only the highest echelons of the social hierarchy, an elitist upper class self-preservation based around a loss of broad power and control. I mean, when was the last time the citizenry actually cried out for war? It doesn't happen, only the politicians go for it. And since the establishment would be hard pressed to explain to their citizens that they are going to invade some nation for its natural resources, maintain currency domination, enable freedom for transnational corporations, along with other generally economic concerns to secure the interests of the upper 1%, Various superficial psychological ploys are used instead. The most common today is the moral crusade. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. Coupled with some basic yet irrational threat of attack. Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile activity poses a real threat, not just to the United States, but to Iran's neighbors and our allies. In the words of famed sociologist Thorsten Veblen, writing from 1917, any warlike enterprise that is hopeful to be entered on must have the moral sanction of the community. It consequently becomes the first concern of the warlike statesman to put this moral force in train for the adventure on which he is bent. You see, a large part of the imperial war is the psychological war against the domestic citizenry itself. The US government spends billions of dollars every year on public relations and recruitment alone, producing signs like this one. For our nation, for us all. Hmm, is it me or does that sound like Orwellian doublespeak? If it's for our nation, then it clearly isn't for us all, as the human species is the closest thing we have to all. And if it's actually referring to all of us in the nation, well, that would be hideously redundant, right? I think what they mean to say in this warm, loving community slogan is, for our nation, screw the rest. Hello, welcome to the show. My name is Pepe, and today I've got something very special for you. A true international delicacy. War. To prepare for war is a very delicate matter. And the first thing we need to do is create some spicy tension to put fire in your belly. So, the first ingredient we need is a well-tempered provocation. Huh? <laughs> Provocations are, of course, seasonal and subject to personal taste. So, may I suggest something along the lines? A marinade golf of Tonkin. <laughs> a robust Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and if you're feeling bored, a bustling 9-11. Then, we let that cook for a bit and prepare our second ingredient over here. <laughs> a special sauté to give life to our fiery dish. The mainstream media. Mm. Oh, oh. That's it. Mm. Whoa! <laughs> Can you just smell the propaganda and delectable ignorance? After we get a nice sizzle going, we now add our final, more important ingredient. The delicious soldiers. Now the most uh, ripe soldiers tend to grow in the more poor rural area of the world, uh, often with limited literacy. Want to pick them around um, 18, 19, because their brain are very immature and quite yummy. <laughs> it's perfect for participation in our war meal. And so we mixed it all together. Up, Up. Up. Thank you. 
Perhaps add a few some preservatives, like patriotism. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> Jingoisms. And of course, our very special secret tools. Okay, and we are ready. <laughs> the moment you have all been waiting for. Voilà. Uh, I present to you the greatest international delicacy of all time. War. Bon appétit. You know, perhaps one of the most amusing aspects of national war is the circus-like pageantry and ceremonialism. Cute costumes, little hats, shiny pieces of metal, various parades and official posturing, and all adornments and theatrics that give this air of honor and authority. Of course, this is not to dismiss the true sacrifice of those who have given their lives in war, as there are always two sides. This true honor comes from a position of working to help others, not exploit them. And just as we hold the bravery of a firefighter who enters a burning building to save a child in high regard, the intention to help society through military service is, indeed, a noble gesture. Even though, sadly enough, 99% of those who enter the military with such noble intentions are more often than not being exploited for the criminal purposes of the corporate state. Still, you have to be impressed by this skill to give credence to an idea merely because of the nature of its presentation. In fact, whether it's academia, the news media, government itself, the military or anything else in society, our culture tends to believe and respect people merely because of their presentation, confidence and rhetoric, not the actual meaning or reasoning of the communication itself. Did you know that the first television sets of the 1950s were actually supposed to be used as prosthetic replacement heads to give new hope for those who had been tragically decapitated? But technology, weight, and cord length being what they were at the time, it failed. Luckily, they could play other things besides the faces of the deceased, and TV sets sold nationwide. And it's all true. You know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. In the end, once the traditional, propagandized illusions in defense of the act of organized human murder and resource theft have been overridden, dismissing such shallow justifications as paternalism, honor, and protectionism, we realize that war today is actually an inherent characteristic of the propertied, scarcity-driven business system. Major General Smedley D. Butler, one of the most notable and decorated officers in U.S. history, stated the following with respect to the business of war in 1935. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the national city boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 through 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that standard oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So given all of this, it's unique how the general public tends to separate the day-to-day -day competitive business acumen from the severe form of competitive violent warfare, when there's very good evidence to show that they are deeply intermeshed. To gain some perspective on this, we now welcome back our resident guru, Louis the Logic Gremlin. Hello. Ah, before we get into the questions, I do have a letter here that I'd like to read to you and get your opinion on. It reads... Dear Peter, I really enjoy the new show. I think it is helping get these important messages across. 
However, I am disappointed with the crude Louis the Logic Gremlin character as it is just irritating and hideously stupid. Also, would you please stop eating when you are speaking in the show? It's really disgusting and annoying. Rock on, Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, Louis, what do you think about that? Totes. Sorry, Joe. Shit stays. All right. So what's the skinny on war, man? Aren't we just crazy animals that have to be in endless conflict with each other due to our biology or something? Okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that war is actually a system consequence. Interesting. So, how do we resolve this war tendency then? Gotcha. Well, thank you for your time, Louis. To gain some public consensus on the issue, we now turn live to our East Coast Culture and Decline correspondent, Big Scotty D, who's live in New York City to talk to people about what they think of war. Well, thank you, Peter. I'm here in uh, New York City on a beautiful, cold day, and uh, we're going to try to find, uh, find some people to maybe talk to... Excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Would you like to... Uh, excuse me, sir. Sir, would you like to talk about the war? What? Would you like to talk about the war, sir? Um, would you like to talk about the war today? The war? No? Yeah, surely, like, would you like to talk about the war? God bless. No? The war, please? The war? No? Would you like to talk about the war? I'm just sick of this, Peter. You're sending me on these assignments. It's freaking freezing out here. You know, it's like I, I'd rather be in a bar getting drunk and then maybe I can do this, all right? I think there's a there's a bar up here. Let me just grab my shit. You know, I'm just sick of this. Stop. That's it. I am done, man. I am done. Get some other monkey, okay? There's trash, there's shit all over the place. What does Peter want to know about? He wants to know about the war. Well, I'm sick of it, man. I gotta calm down. I just need a drink. Any, any of you uh, Occupy Wall Street types? Oh, it's all about money. Except when you can't eat. And it's not about foreclosures. Except when you got nowhere to sleep. It's not about elections. Except when they can be bought. And it's not about the wars. Except when they're fought. It's not about the environment, except when we're running out of time. And it's not about my choices, except when they're not mine. It's not the lack of justice, except when you can't fight back. And it's not about the police, unless um you're black. Fuck this shit. So totally ruled by the one percent, which is basically all the corporations wanting to sell us shit and influence us and influence our culture, so that we can't even think for ourselves, and we're we're our sense of self is altered, and even like our sense of health. And, like, I don't even fucking smoke. I don't know where this come from. Jesus. Peter Joseph has asked us to stand out here in the freezing cold and talk about the difference of classes here. But you know, he's sitting in like his L.A. loft, like relaxing with like his big, you know. Flat screen TV. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> fuck Peter Joseph. 
Um, the only thing that we don't have is like a, a war on something is, is war on war. And I think that's because like us peace activists, we, we don't want to fight. So we're going to end up losing t t due to irony. Final thoughts. How do we think about resolution to something as detrimental as national war when, on the micro level, we in society actually praise, reward, and reinforce the same basic underlying competitive drive? Generally, when faced with such a question, people tend to play the morality card, as though a matter of degree is what's relevant, not the philosophical basis itself. And usually this vague distinction is gestured to the effect that competition is good, but we should never go too far and be violent in any way. So then, of course, the question becomes, what constitutes violence? What if, instead of physically attacking you directly, I put you into a subtle yet deeply toxic condition where your life was shortened by decades via heart disease, cancer, mental illness, and other such consequences? Would that be considered violent? And what if such intentions were not even directly malicious, such as a lower class, desperate single mother forced to work three jobs to keep up, who fails one night to provide proper supervision for her child, resulting in the death of her child? I ask you, what is the true origin of the resulting death? And does that qualify as violent? To paraphrase Mahatma Gandhi, poverty is the worst form of violence. You see, the real war going on is not as obvious as many think. The real war exists in the very structure of our society itself, something public health officials have now termed structural violence, a war, in fact, against public health and balance itself, constantly producing casualty after casualty in its hidden oppression. And this form of violence today kills more people than every type of direct behavioral violence put together. Its origin? A social system literally built upon competition and exploitation itself. So for all you noble activists out there, for all of you who pile into protest zones each time a new national war emerges and yell at the top of your lungs, keep in mind that you are only targeting a symptom of a larger sociological problem. And until the activist community realizes this, I'm sorry to say, your protests have no long-term consequence, as they do not address the root problem. But on the bright side, it's still great entertainment, right? So let's keep watching this bizarre human experiment. Certainly the greatest yet worst reality show of all time for sure. I'm Peter Joseph, and yes, I, like you, am an agent and victim of a culture in decline. Where's the credit scene? What? What do you mean Bob didn't get hurt? I'm sorry, Bob. It's the format of the show. What if what I'm about to tell you makes you question what is what? What if I propose a what if scenario? What if I were to take up precious time in your busy life, just spinning you in a soul dulling spiral with meaningless double talk? But at the same time, what if I kept you distracted with flashy graphics? Would you notice? Or for that matter, would you care? Nah, you're too busy listening to some guy in a tie and sleep. Then, at 2.50 p.m., more than half the runners were through.
the first bomb explodes. Breaking news from Canada. Police say they've broken up an Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist attack that was aimed to disrupt a major North American transportation route. A sharp new warning of all-out war for the first time, the mysterious and secretive nation has threatened a preemptive nuclear strike against the U.S. Staying in Europe, Spain is also feeling the economic pinch. One in four are now currently unemployed in that country, and the EU expects that number to climb even higher. China and neighboring countries are mobilizing resources to fight off a new strain of bird flu. Hospitals in a race against time to contain nightmare super bacteria before it spreads from the hospital out into ah. the world. Jesus, oh, you scared me. But hey, I guess that's okay, right? I mean, if you watch the news these days, there seems to be a lot to be concerned about. Nuclear war, terrorism, mass shootings, city bombings, corporate fraud, bird flu, bank failures, unemployment, contamination, gangs, general crime. And depending on your temperament and conditioning, perhaps you've already armed yourself to the teeth and are watching this show from an underground bunker somewhere waiting for the end of civilization itself. Well, whatever the concern, the idea of protection or security from such woes are ever pervasive today. Prisons, police, insurance, warranties, protection agencies, military and domestic armament, airport groping, government surveillance and the like, reveals a, a culture of fear, if you will, on many levels. Not to mention that the modern trends of such security risks are certainly fascinating. For example, before the 1980s, the thought of someone going into their workplace and, you know, wiping out a couple people was a relatively remote concept. Today, we repeatedly see these acts of seemingly random violence, not only in businesses, but at schools, churches, movie theaters, malls, sporting events, and other common institutions. And as unfortunate as this dark reality of our human capacity is, it's perhaps not as unfortunate as the archaic methods we as a civilization have concocted in our attempt to counter such problems. For instance, in the wake of growing U.S. gun violence, the National Rifle Association will tell you that the problem is a lack of armed security at every turn. And if we only would just, you know, arm everybody like the Wild West, problems of social violence would subside. While at the other extreme, folks will tell you that the problem is rather Due to an ease of access, it's too simple to get weaponry, and the removal of this easy access is now the correct path. However, do either of these address the real issue, the source of the behavioral problem at hand? Where is the national discussion about, say, motivation and the sociological condition itself to which these acts erupt? I point this out because in a technological age where people can now print automatic weapons in secret with home 3D printers, paving the way for an eventual nanotech revolution that will enable the public to create powerful weapons at home, bypassing commercial regulation itself, perhaps we need to rethink our sense of causality here. For unless you intend to outlaw scientific progress itself, regulation isn't going to amount to a damn thing in the long run. Likewise, come to think of it, maybe we also need to step back and reframe what a viable threat to our safety really is and how it measures up to other threats. You know, on April 15th, 2013, bombs exploded during the Boston Marathon in the United States, killing three people, gaining global attention, almost like it was another 9-11. Yet in Iraq, on the exact same Monday, bombs exploded, killing 20 times as many people. Yet no one in the mainstream media seemed to care much about that. You see, if you pay attention, you might notice that the true quantifiable magnitude of a threat or the actual toll of violence really doesn't mean much in the establishment perception. It's the idea, the context, the political spectacle that matters. And this might explain why America has spent almost $5 trillion on so-called terrorism when U.S. citizens today and statistically have always been more likely to die of a peanut allergy or in the bathtub than in a terrorist attack. So as the following episode will argue, the security fear industry stretching from the ever-exploitative news media to the military-industrial complex to the criminal justice system not only exploits sociological distortion birthed out of the very fabric of our deprivation, scarcity-driven social order, it now appears to be accelerating in a vicious cycle. And I don't know about you, but given all of this, I'm beginning to suspect that maybe 
just maybe the very foundation of our socioeconomic system is in play here. No longer existing as a functional mode for human progress on this planet, but rather as a conduit for a culture in decline. Prison, from the dark dungeons of the Middle Ages to our modern industrial mass incarceration correctional facilities, the prison system is a signature edifice of society today. The United States, the land of the free, now has the highest inmate population in the world, incarcerating over 2.3 million, in fact. The U.S. has locked up more people than any other country on the planet, boastfully housing 25% of the entire world's prison population with an 800% increase in incarceration in the past 30 years alone. Based partly on the need to remove active threats from society, coupled with an ever bleak undertone of retribution and revenge, the punitive negative reinforcement tradition common to our justice system is now being challenged by some very basic realizations in the human sciences. We often forget that when it comes to human conduct, true behavioral causality has historically been ignored with the focus rather on spooky, superstitious forces such as good and evil. Well, as convenient as such ambiguous metaphysical assumptions are, modern social science now places so-called criminal or anti-social acts in the context of public health, with real solutions resting in the arena of preventive medicine, not mere punishment. Of course, as with most rational perspectives in the world today, this view is rather agitated for it shatters the glorified, free will, morally empirical, traditional assumptions our entire criminal justice system is built upon. However, let's put that aside for now and point out the fact that while most naturally do fear prison, its effect as a deterrent is actually quite weak. Considering US trends, we see a massive increase in incarceration over time, so with this basic observation, the punitive threat of prison clearly isn't working statistically. Likewise, prison is supposed to be some form of rehabilitation center, right? So does this system work to reform human behavior, taking in so-called criminals, and outputting mentally healthy, law-abiding citizens? Uh, no. In the United States, two-thirds of prisoners released reoffend within three years, often with a more serious and violent offense. Dr. James Gilligan, former director of the Center for the Study of Violence at Harvard Medical School, actually refers to prisons as graduate schools for crime and violence. So given all of this, perhaps we need to step back a bit, shake off the shackles of common perception, and ask ourselves what other roles the judicial and prison system really have. For if incarceration isn't statistically working as a deterrent, and those who get out of prison are more often worse than they were when they went in, something is clearly wrong. What else is going on here? You know, while the justification of incarceration is certainly viable with respect to true social threats, no different than the medical need to quarantine somebody who is a threat to society because of a contagious disease, the evolution of the prison tradition reveals some very dark truths. And the best way to think about it is from an historical perspective, considering race conflict, class conflict, in the context of economic and political expedience. The first thing to understand is that political power, like economic power, is sourced in social inefficiency. In other words, politicians need something to fight. And to a certain degree, the more problems a society has, the more the citizens tend to feel the need to give up their power to government control, with the most proven effective type of problem being fear. Usually fear of some perceived identifiable external group. Of course, this idea has been acknowledged for years, such as by political theorist Carl Schmitt in his The Concept of the Political, saying that political unity is achieved by defining a common enemy. Nothing new. The Nazis did this with the Jewish culture, the early U.S. did this with the Native American culture, and so on. 
In short, the trick is to push the idea that some subculture, usually in the minority, is the true source of all of society's woes, generating mass resentment and thereby ignoring more accurate, yet politically inconvenient realities. And while direct racism and discrimination is certainly alive and well in the world today, the more elusive yet relevant bias is actually economic. You see, the greatest threat to any political establishment is... What? What do you mean? This? This is a platform. It's three-dimensional. It's the base. It's the... Yeah, I know it's not very good. Fuck off, Bob. Don't, don't make me shoot you again. You see, the greatest threat to any political establishment is any challenge to its underlying economic foundation, as all political platforms are rooted in an economic bias one way or another. And if you can brainwash the public into, say, viewing the failures of capitalism as instead rooted in the poor moral virtue of a trouble-causing subsection of the population, rather than a built-in consequence of perhaps capitalism's elitist psychology and scarcity-driven structure, you can maintain control. And this is where the common enemy scapegoat scam comes into play. It's not that bad. We simply demonize the victims of this system, shifting blame away from the more relevant, environmental, causal, social condition itself. And in the context of the justice system, the war on crime is a perfect tool. All the war on crime is, is a war on the poor and economically irrelevant. And if a society is conditioned to believe that a person breaking into their car to steal property is simply an amoral abomination with all the life choices in the world otherwise to make ends meet, then the causal shift is a success. The reality, however, is that most of those incarcerated today are there almost always due to crimes born from deprivation. Deprivation, which can be generalized in two forms, relative and absolute. Absolute deprivation is when a person's most basic needs are simply not met, and poverty is the lead source. The spectrum of disorder that arises from poverty is vast, from drug dealing, theft and prostitution in areas lacking employment opportunities, to emotional loss, self-worth neuroses and illegal self-medication, leading to complex and elusive chain reactions which can result in destructive antisocial behavior. Today, one out of every 15 African-American kids in the United States have at least one parent in prison, usually the father. It's bad enough that the father figure is important to familial survival as the historical breadwinner, but the proven emotional toll on children who must go without such an influential parental figure also has dark results, as those children are also statistically more likely to be imprisoned as adults, in fact. And if you combine poverty with emotional deprivation, you have the perfect recipe for not only the manifestation of socially aberrant behavior, but the perpetuation of such distortions across generational time. Relative deprivation, on the other hand, is when our sense of worth and self-respect is associated to our cultural perception of success. While absolute deprivation is measured by basic health concerns, expressing the ever-important need for society to work to efficiently meet our mutable human needs for sanity and true security, relative deprivation exists in the realm of subjective comparison and resulting dehumanization. And likely the greatest example of this negative pressure is the state of class imbalance in the world. While it is true that the formerly classified poor of the West today actually live, in material terms, better than the upper class a thousand years ago, the dehumanizing wealth stratification occurring today continues to create complex, destabilizing psychosocial problems. Long considered an incentive for social progress, class difference and wealth imbalance has turned out to be a powerful public health issue generating massive psychological and sociological distortion. I want to be intellectually honest, the issues raised here have more to do with commerce than they do with a Second Amendment. A lot of people make a lot of money selling firearms and ammunition. The National Rifle Association has said the solution is to have armed security guards at every school. Certainly, you know, every piece of security we engage in can be helpful. But it's, you know, foolish to think that only security is what we need. You know, the great challenge is here, can we prevent these tragedies? 
Having I'm sorry to interrupt, Chief, but since you've just brought up this notion of prevention, which is, of course, the real issue here, right? I'm curious when this conversation is going to move to more relevant social science. You know, I, I see we have, for example, the NRA here. Hi. Uh, yet we don't have anyone from the pharmaceutical industry. Isn't it true that most of the mass shootings that have commenced have been done by people who are under the influence of psychologically mood-altering medications? Or better yet, where's the drug czar of this country? Since the war on drugs has commenced, there has been a massive increase in gun-related drug violence. Are we just going to ignore this causality as well? Or better yet, I almost forgot, I have here about a hundred years of data on the relationship between economic imbalance, specifically wealth imbalance, and violence. You know, the stats have become very clear now that the gap between the rich and the poor creates more violence. The more gap, the more violence. And crime on the whole. Which might explain, by the way, why the United States, with the largest income gap in the world, also has the most violence and worst public health of any first world nation. Is this not worth a congressional discussion? I mean, with all due respect, you people can't possibly be naive enough to think that the reduction of certain guns, as the left suggests, or the increase in armed security in public places, as the right suggests, is really going to have a long-term effect on such deeply rooted sociological problems, right? A problem clearly rooted in structured dehumanization and economic deprivation. It's inherent to our social system. You know, is it not of some viable consideration to address this issue? No? Really? And then we have the so-called war on drugs. When Richard Nixon declared the drug war in 1971, he asked for an initial $84 million. In 2013, the National Drug Control Budget requested $25.6 billion. With about a trillion dollars spent in total, and the result over time has been more drugs, easier access, increased potency, and more users. Today, almost half of the federal prison population are non-violent drug offenders. Often mere users, in fact. Clearly a mental health issue rather than a punitive one. Draconian mandatory sentencing laws today can send kids to prison for decades for mere possession. And it is no secret that this criminalized subculture has been mostly born out of the prohibitive underground economies necessarily sprouted in poor areas of the country largely occupied by minorities. As an aside, we often forget how deeply racist the United States has been historically, assuming vast improvement. And yet today, there are more African Americans behind bars than were slaves before the American Civil War. After segregation, the black community was strategically isolated into low-income inner-city ghettos, which systematically robbed them of economic opportunity. And as the national culture matured, with racism slowly dissipating through the civil rights movement, the economic oppression set in motion at that time remained, creating a powerful cycle ever since. Today, one out of every three black men are expected to go to prison at some point in their lives. And in effect, the real oppressive mechanism in the world today is no longer race, but economic class. And the punchline is brutal. Not only are the poor and forgotten of our society conveniently turned into criminals, rather than clear examples of the failure of our social model, capitalist ingenuity prevails once again, transforming these people into pure, saleable commodities, creating a massive profit industry out of an otherwise economically useless social class. From thriving income generation via fines, tickets, bail posting, and lawyer fees, to the now massive network of servicing the millions of inmates via health care, food production, security hiring, parole officers, and the like, the prison and security industrial complex in the West is a thriving business enterprise and positive factor on economic growth. The cost to imprison one person for one year in the state of California is about $47,000. Extrapolating that to the total U.S. 2013 prison population of about 2.3 million, the incarceration service alone amounts to over $100 billion a year in income, and this isn't counting the other 5 million currently being serviced on parole. Today, the Corrections Corporation of America, G4S Wackenhut, and other private for-profit security and prison firms benefit their investors and shareholders when incarceration rates increase. 
Not to mention the now extremely common labor use, or slave labor use I should say, of the prisoners themselves. And yes, we might feel some moral outrage when a Pennsylvanian judge gets caught sending kids to private detention centers for cash kickbacks. But then again, are we really surprised? There are even small towns in the Midwest where the majority are employed by the local prison. And if they don't have crime and prisoners, their town's economy is in the toilet. Not to mention that most police departments derive enormous funding from drug arrests and seizures. If the drug war stopped, the police department would lose billions in this country. And yes, the rabbit hole runs even deeper. If we step back even farther, we see a broader economic reinforcement here. You see, the drug trade is far from limited to your local street thugs. Today, US and European banks launder about $1 trillion in criminal, mostly drug money each year. Drug money has actually become a very relevant part of the Wall Street machine. Even just recently, HSBC Bank got caught moving about a billion dollars in drug money. Did the criminal executives get sent to jail? Of course not. Why? Because the legal system is mostly there to control the poor, not regulate the rich. HSBC paid a fine and moved on, likely working to reposition themselves again like the dozen or so other major banks that continue to launder drug money each year. Dick. Anyway, returning to our main point, this now highly capitalized blame game, common enemy approach, is not just there to dismiss the resulting poor, it is ubiquitous at every turn. Whether common crime, terrorism, mass murders, or anything destabilizing, we see the mainstream media, and even many in the so-called activist community, completely missing the point buried under the propaganda of in-the-box establishment self-preservation to one degree or another. And you know what Bill Moyer's solution to that is? Let nonviolent criminals out, like heroin dealers. Yeah, that's nonviolent. You're a genius, Bill. To have universal gun registration. But what about... Wait, that's an important what? point. I am listening. For some reason, Wayne LaPierre is not making, so you're going to have to hear it from me. Universal background check means universal registration. Universal registration means universal confiscation, universal extermination. You know, it's like God is saying to us, look, you got to work with me on this. you got to work with me on this. I've given you a brain... I've given you the Second Amendment to your Constitution. I have given you weapons. Now, why don't you use them? The tyrants did it. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Many... Hugo Chavez took the guns. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. <laughs> and the 21st century culture in decline, belligerent right-winged freak show award goes to... Alex Jones. <laughs> Whoa! Do that, you son of a bitch! Huh. It's about time I won an award. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alex Jones. And you know what? I'm here to rape your butt! You know why? Because it's gonna feel better if I do it before the New World Order does! That's right! The globalists are positioning themselves behind you right now. They're going to take your guns, put you in FEMA camps, and make you their slaves. They think I'm a slave? I'm not a slave. And then late one night when you're drinking their homosexually fortified juice boxes, damn, the butt rape begins. And you'll be happy that old Alex was there first to loosen you up real nice and good. Now, people, I'm not going to take too much time because huh, I'm a humble man. But I want everybody to go to my website right now and buy my newest DVD, The Conspiracy, Conspiracy, How the Global Elite Pays Me to Make the Liberty Movement Look Insane. That's right, people. I'm an astroturfer. I'm not here to help things. I'm here to make activists look like freaks. I take viable issues of real concern and make them sound as ridiculous as possible, just like all the other bobbleheads out there. I'm here to distract you, you morons and keep you fighting about nonsense. And I get paid to do it. <laughs> Woo! We interrupt this broadcast for an emergency announcement. It's an emergency because we say it is. This just in, U.S. airports remain on high alert at this time due to a pronounced terror threat. 
According to the FBI, a new sophisticated form of terrorist technology has surfaced, which is now forcing rapid new revisions of TSA airport security procedures. That's correct, Summer. On the heels of the 2006 liquid bomb threat and 2009 underwear bomber, this obscure new approach was revealed to authorities in a videotape allegedly found in an outhouse in Willy Wonkistan. While the date of the video is unknown, along with no clear understanding of who made it, the use of machetes, headdresses, and Arabic language was enough for federal authorities to declare it is indeed Al-Qaeda. The rather grainy video appears to show a medical procedure instructing how to implant explosives in the body cavities of babies, puppies, and kittens. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> <laughs> Baby go boom! In response to this development, the TSA, after an initial failed attempt to simply ban such creatures outright, has now instituted a new universal rule. All carry-on babies and small pets under 52 ounces must be sealed in a see-through plastic bag. Most people don't realize, but the Earth has been slowing for many years. And were it not for these huge and expensive fans behind me, we would have ground to a complete day and night halt. And every word out of my mouth is true. Do you know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but Bob is officially dead. Final thoughts. We live in a social model based upon scarcity and inefficiency. This means that the more society solves problems, meets human needs, and stabilizes itself by recognizing the potentials and limits of natural law, the less economically viable it is in the monetary economy. There's a reason why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final pursuit was a guaranteed income system in the United States. For he knew that racism was, in many ways, an extension of classism, and the existence of poverty and deprivation in a world that can create an abundance to meet everyone's needs was nothing more than structural oppression coming from a failed and elitist social system. An impression that, in fact, generates crime and destabilization in a vicious cycle. You want to see a decline in prohibitive economies for drug sales, prostitution, and black market theft rings? You want to see society stop its enormous use of self-medicating drugs, both legal and illegal? You want to see an end of national war, an improvement of our social infrastructure so disease and accidents can be dropped to a relative fraction of what we have now? Or perhaps you want to see the end of school shootings gun violence and acts of terrorism, both in the context of state-funded black ops and real blowback, that it's time the human family recognize its global potential to achieve a post-scarcity reality, work to strategically share our resources, work to meet human needs directly, and focus collaborative energy on interests for true collective human betterment, hence removing the inherent warfare unnecessarily built into our archaic socioeconomic system along with all the resulting racism, hatred, dehumanization, oppression, and elitism it manifests. And no, I'm not telling you to go write your congressman. If the social system is the disease, then those who appoint themselves to assist its operation are the tumors and lesions. Voting with ballots or assuming what you choose to spend money on is going to change the way this world works is a delusion. It's going to take a new approach, a parallel uprising of power to shift the tide. And whether we're aware of it or not, this is happening slowly right now around us in the world. And the question is, where are you in this interest? And do you even care? If not, well, welcome to the culture in decline. And this show, as shitty as it is, is going to keep running. If so, then perhaps maybe this terrible reality show may come to an end faster than we think. But until that happens, rest assured I'll be here, arrogantly pointing out that most everything you believe and hold dear is wrong. So get back to your Bibles, video games, internet porn, and AK-47s, bitches, and have some fun out there in this dark circus we call normality. And until next time, I'm Peter Joseph, and whether you like me or not, I exist as an agent and victim of a culture in decline. <laughs>
Don't let this fatly looking body fool you, okay? I work out four times a day, I run 19 miles a day, and I drink tangy tangerine like it's my job, all right? I'm only big like this because the new old order makes me People, you know what keeps old Alex up at night? It's these daggum gobelists. I'm sorry, I said gobelists. <laughs> Listen up, people. These neocons are suckling the buzzard. That ain't your mama. It's these NWO scum. They're going around trying to butt rape everybody. They're just nothing but a butt rape machine. <laughs> it's these NWO globalist communist scum that are going around like a butt rape machine. I'm a butt rape machine, butt rape machine. People, I am a butt rape machine. You know what? Instead of the bald eagle, the national symbol should be a man laying in submission in the fetal position, peeing on himself. That's what it should be. Peeing all over his damn self. If you can't tell, this is all an act. It's a shtick. That's why I act all crazy and shit. Flailing my arms and my neck like this. It's an act. It's a shtick. I need money. <laughs> Woo. Keep grunting. Yeah, how about that? You want like some of that? You want some, Peter? <laughs> <laughs>
But when I stumble around this planet we call home, a system condition that demands one thing to ensure the prosperity of the human family adaptation, I'm at once impressed at our tremendous accomplishments as a species and at once horrified at the ignorant failures, mostly resulting from a refusal to see the Earth as one system design and humanity as one family bound within. So as this season finale of Culture and Decline will argue, humanity is being faced with a choice, a fork in the road. And it is my personal conviction that the broad social decisions made this generation might very well be what makes or breaks our species in the long run. And perhaps by the end of this episode, you like me will feel the need to think about which path we should choose, a culture in ascent or a culture in decline. Science fiction writers, scientists, and so-called futurists of the world have painted many pictures of what the future may hold. Some are modest, positive, or even utopian. Some are dystopian, dark, and oppressive. As far as the probable truth, the best we can do is measure the trends and average out the projections, with perhaps, of course, the most relevant trend being the influence of science and technology. Of course, technological progress has its culture lag, right? However, Today, doesn't it seem like the gap between our scientific advancement and our actual understanding and consideration of that advancement is growing wider and wider? Doesn't it seem a little bit obvious that technological capacity is exceeding social maturity? It's actually a frightening point in truth. As it's a cultural value issue, science and technology put into the hands of forward-thinking developers who perhaps recognize the profound capacity to create an abundance, stabilize our ecological influence, and become sustainable both environmentally and culturally, tend to view the world very differently than the more common market nationalist elitist mindset, which sees society through the filter of narrow self-interest and competition, constantly reinforcing that gain at the expense of others is a law of nature and hence a virtue to be praised and rewarded. In this context, we might see how those same tools will be used to make bigger weapons, more surveillance technology, and ever stronger physical and psychological prisons for the vast majority of humanity, to remain in servitude to a small group of people and essentially the ownership class. So with that in mind, I present to you a thought exercise. Using my fresh new time machine here, I'm going to be your guide on a trip to two possible futures. First, we will visit a world that just may be if the current social, ecological, and technical patterns persist as they are. Then, we will visit a possible future that very well could be if we as a species were willing to simply employ our vast potential to forge a new, highly efficient societal design with new practices. A design which is not utopian or idealistic, but rather quite simple, practical, and doable, if we simply made the decision to change in accord with the logic of our natural existence. New York City, 2110. It's been a while since the fall of the U.S. Empire, and by extension, the general decline of much of the world. The massive influence of U.S. economic policy, along with the corresponding materialistic, inefficient, and wasteful values born out of the consumption-based growth economy, began to reach its physical limits in the mid-21st century. Until that point, the race towards global industrialization continued unabated 
with the world still pining for the so-called American dream, not computing that if the entire world acted with the same waste patterns as the US, we would have needed four more Earths worth of resources just to keep it all going. What happened? Well, there were three nails in the coffin of societal collapse. The synergy of these issues compounded each other into a vicious storm. And by the time the Earth hit a population of 8 billion, right before the Third World War, global unemployment reached levels of 65%, every government on Earth was bankrupt to each other, and the core hydrocarbon energy sources saw destabilizing scarcity. And while China did win the war, what resolution was achieved didn't last long. The cancer and health epidemics alone in Asia and beyond rose to catastrophic proportions, with a third of the planet still uninhabitable today due to industrial pollution. Today, the global population has fallen by 40% due to scarcity and disease. As far as the energy crisis, the early 21st century made tremendous progress in understanding renewable, sustainable energy systems. We were learning on paper how to stop our use of inherently scarce, polluting energy stores in the earth, realizing the almost unlimited abundance of our regenerative universe, and energy income that could provide for everyone many times over if we only moved fast enough to create the proper infrastructure. Unfortunately, such a transition attempt was met with great resistance by financial interests. You see, there was this thing called the free market, which was far from free, in truth. It was a war and elitist protection system, and the bigger and more profitable an industry became, the less financial incentive existed to alter it. Money was the goal of this game, not sustainability or efficiency. And the fact was, we needed to move fast, utilizing the remaining hydrocarbon resources to create new sustainable energy infrastructure. It was a race against global population increases and hence needs. And sadly, we failed. Passing the point of no return, as once the true scarcity of our hydrocarbon resources became understood, social destabilization and panic rapidly commenced to further barricade. And what little progress did take place was rapidly destroyed thereafter by the water and energy wars. At the same time, the world faced the largest unemployment rates in history. Long considered a Luddite myth, the exponential increase in machine automation in the 21st century created a powerful acceleration of industrial productivity at ever cheaper rates, displacing workers more rapidly than technology could actually create new jobs. Forward thinkers saw a great shift in the architecture of society. Perhaps the ancient idea of earning a living could be replaced with living a life. We could see the new capacity to create an abundance to meet the needs of every human being on Earth, 8 billion and beyond. But sadly, this prospect met the same fate as our energy ambitions. The corporations, locked into a manner of thought which viewed mechanization as not a means for abundance, but rather a means to save even more money in the process of production, set up a violent clash. Not only a clash between workers and owners, but, ironically, a clash of system functions. For capitalism was faced with its most grand contradiction, where suddenly labor could exist with increasingly less human involvement, and hence the constant pursuit of cost efficiency for profit inevitably meant that less money would be put into circulation through wages. And so the system ran itself down into an ever-weakening slump. Noticing this, the cry of some was to stop mechanization, knowing the economy literally needed jobs by design. Others performed activism to try and convince the world that it was time to adapt, to simply give humanity what it needed, to bypass the market. Why should we invent more jobs to waste human life just to keep this system going? Yet, of course, they were bashed in the media, dismissed as socialist upstarts and freedom-hating communists, trying to corrupt the supposed liberty of what was nothing more than a religion, the all-seeing market. And by the time the corporate-controlled governments couldn't look the other way any longer, the momentum of anger and dismay was too much. The unions went on strike, and the cry for revolution exploded. The Luddites blamed technology for the problems, the businesses blamed government interference, the counterculture blamed idealized conspiracies, with few realizing that it was a system failure, 
a natural evolution of our culture which demanded respect and adaptation. And the third and perhaps most absurd of all social plagues was the illusion of financial debt. It's an interesting historical note that for some reason the mafia style organized crime mode of the market was never really accepted as a legitimate consequence when it was in fact a ruling ethos inherent in the competitive scarcity driven nature of the system. Centuries of denial can be found in the endless economic textbooks of this now failed model saying that if any such behavior did occur it was an anomaly, a corruption rather than a core characteristic expected of the system itself. Within this propensity, a debt system emerged. Whether structurally intended as a force of class warfare or not, the system served the elite quite well for a little while. Every form of currency produced was created out of debt and loaned at interest to the governments, businesses, and individuals. Yet, it was a mathematical impossibility for this debt to ever be repaid as there was always more debt in the global economy than money to pay it back due to the profit mechanism of interest being charged. And while this allowed for a surplus of cheap labor that further divided the classes, moving from 1% owning 40% of the planet's wealth in the early 21st century to now 1% owning 70%, the viral nature of the mechanism got the best of everyone in the end. To expand the delusion, global banking institutions were then installed. To loan money made out of debt, again, to the now bankrupt countries, only to watch these world banks fail over time as well. It was the greatest inadvertent scam of all time, a pyramid scheme on steroids, destined to fail for all. And by the time of World War III, all the countries had defaulted to each other and the global banking system collapsed. Of course, during these trials, the illusion of so-called democracy still persisted, equally as religious and mythological in its understanding as the so-called free market. Everyone turned to their representative government, a mafia constituency to be sure, intimately in bed with the corporate financial interests, which by virtue of the ruling ethic of social and class warfare and competition had little structural incentive to care about the vast majority of the world. And so it went. Not too pretty, huh? Well, while this future may be a little extreme in its presentation, keep in mind this is what the trends suggest. However, I think it's time we take a positive view of the future, one that's actually quite possible if we were intelligent enough to adjust accordingly. Uh, what the shit? Where am I? Uh, I must have dialed wrong. Oh wait, we went in the past to the 2013 Zeitgeist Media Festival, sweet. Oh, and there's Kelly Mays doing her thing. <laughs> If we do these things when the tree is green, oh please, what will happen when it dies? I create and know somewhere deep in the unseen is the key that will open up our eyes. If we do these things. So, what do you think the future is going to be like in, say, a hundred years? Well, um, I think we could go down two, two paths. The first would be that we continue to sort of build on top of this cancer consciousness separation, every human being for themselves kind of a thing. Um, I don't necessarily like that idea. Um, but I do think there's another direction that we could go. Um, I would love to see people working together in community. I think we're missing the whole kind of tribal element. As, as Mouse would say, I would love everybody to live in tree houses. I mean, I really believe that we have the technology to deal with every imaginable problem on the earth. We have plants that can bioremediate, like sunflowers, for example. We have, um, you know, everything that's available to us to fix all of these problems, to create incredible abundance, to not have to deal with this ridiculously corrupt monetary system. Ah, man, I hate to leave this sweet-ass festival. It really is amazing how the arts contribute to social development. And yes, life really should be a celebration, not a trial. But okay, let's get back to work. Los Angeles, 2110. 
What was once a sea of congested traffic and agitating urban sprawl in the early 21st century has been transformed into a model of efficiency and safety. The 9 to 5 workday tradition, which forced most of society to cram into gridlocked highways en route to a kind of covert slavery, is a distant memory of a new, highly advanced technological society. Contribution to society is no longer based on the narrow, selfish pursuit of personal gain. Money lost its use long ago as the foundational premise of its existence was outgrown. The culture finally realized that a basic, technical system of collaboration, sharing resources and ideas, would enable a highly abundant, sustainable and stable world, unlike anything the market ethic of scarcity, competition and class warfare could fathom. It was called the Great Transition, where the benefit of taking an earth-wide system perspective, coupled with the application of basic physical and social science, set in motion a train of thought that transcended most everything we had considered normal in the early 21st century. And while it is far from perfect, the basic design to take care of everyone worked, while still structurally respecting the natural environment, unleashing a kind of human freedom and capacity for development never before seen. To understand how this new world emerged, we need to start by recognizing a trend which became apparent in the early 20th century. With humanity having spent the vast majority of existence under the veil of superstition, impending scarcity and general elitism, the idea of not having enough to go around and the perpetuation of haves and have-nots appeared to be simply an immutable law of nature. War after war, genocide after genocide, it intuitively appeared that this was simply the way the human condition was to be. However, with the development of science and the notion of something called technical efficiency, a pattern began to emerge which set the stage for likely the most radical change in human societal operation in history. It was called ephemeralization, the ability to do more and more with less and less. As paradoxical as it may seem, our advancement in understanding how to use our planetary resources, in conjunction with the emerging laws of natural science, set in motion a pattern of conservation and efficiency where, over time, less and less materials, labor and energy were needed to produce and execute more and more life-supporting processes. For example, the first computer built in the 1940s covered 1,800 square feet of floor space, weighed 30 tons and consumed 160 kilowatts of electric power. Today, an inexpensive pocket-sized cell phone computes substantially faster, running on virtually nothing in comparison. Communication, which used to require enormous amounts of arduous copper wire to facilitate phone calls, has been replaced by lightweight satellites. Physical home construction, which took massive amounts of resources and labor, eventually evolved into using lightweight, prefabricated structures which could be assembled by automation using a fraction of the materials and labor as before, and yet were substantially stronger and durable. Even the core foundation of nutrition, agriculture, which, since the start of the Neolithic period, was bound to certain regions for certain climates and land propensities, saw a revolution in versatility, where soilless farming systems could provide organic food locally, without pesticides, using less fertilization, and with little energy wasted on transport. The very idea of globalization was a distant memory, along with the vast waste it created. In effect, no industry or sub-industry was amiss with this trend. Even labor itself, with the application of automation finally applied as the target means for production, exploded efficiency and capacity, with less and less human toil necessary over time. By the mid-21st century, even the idea of mass good production was also no more, as advancements in modular robotics and nanotechnology allowed for good production to exist on-site, on demand, in a kind of variety never before seen in capitalism. The idea of producing goods in mass and storing inventory was no more. In fact, most homes now had production rooms, which printed the basic clothes, household tools, and general needs right there on site. And on and on the efficiency grew, bringing the world into a condition of post-scarcity abundance, where, within the educational framework of natural law, Respecting that there are indeed limits to growth and consumption, a new human value system emerged which gloried in its capacity to increase efficiency and maintain ecological balance and sustainability. 
not only physical sustainability per se, but cultural sustainability. Taking care of everyone was not a poetic consequence. It was a core focus to create a form of earthly harmony unknown before. Of course, none of these transitions came easily. The market economy and those who profited most dogmatically tried to stop this advancement as the elitism they held dear was drawn into question. It took decades of activism and showing the world, including those of great power and wealth, that life could be much better for them as well, along with everyone else, and that the market system simply was incompatible with this new mode of optimized efficiency, an efficiency desperately needed to not only progress society, but save it. Oh, shit, I gotta get back. It's almost time for my favorite TV show. Bitch. We now return to Free Market Fun Sack. Welcome back to Free Market Fun Sack, the game that tests your understanding of the global economy and reminds us that true freedom is our ability to restrict the freedom of others. We're now in our final action round with the remaining categories. Those wacky Austrians. What mafia? Fuck you and your college dream. And gimme, 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 mine, mine, mine. Tammy, it's your turn. Sam, I'll take fuck you and your college dream for 300, please. Currently in the United States, which form of indirect slavery is most actively saving the ownership class by generating legions of young, desperate laborers? Tim? Sam, that would be dead slavery. That's correct, Tim. In fact, there's now about $1.2 trillion in student debt alone. An excellent career motivator to be sure. Tim, you're up. I'll take what mafia for 400, please? Which free market induced cartel currently maintains the most oppressive power over life improving public health policies? Tammy? The Federal Reserve. Close, but no. Fred? The Food and Drug Administration. There we go. That's right, folks. We do have cures for cancer. Too bad it would interfere with the bottom line of the existing medical mafia. Fred? Yeah, Sam, I'll take gimme, 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 mine, mine, mine for 600. Which continent has been most capitalized upon for its natural resources and cost-efficient labor since the start of the British Empire? Fred? Asia? Very close, but no. Tammy? South America? Uh, even closer, but no bueno. Tim. Africa. You got it. Oil, minerals, spices, land, and even people have been taken by the West and put to good economic work for hundreds of years. Economic efficiency at its best. That buzzer means we're out of time. Fred, you're our new winner. Tammy and Tim, please enter your designated free market fun sacks as your fates have been set to help contribute to the emerging market economies of the third world. Ed. That's right, Sam. Tammy is off to luscious Thailand to be a sex slave in one of the most promising markets of the region, human trafficking. While Tim is off to Southeast Asia to work for 18 hours a day for 10 cents an hour, making expensive sneakers for American school children. Thank you all for joining us. Now a word from our sponsor. Most people have no idea that golf was invented by Alphonse Leggert, whose glass eye popped out in the park when he sneezed too hard. Because of his broken leg, he had to putt the eye all the way home before his wife retrieved it for him. But by then, he knew he had a new sport and a dream. It's all true. Know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. Final thoughts. I've spent the beginning of my focus in activism by doing what most everyone else was doing, blaming other people and institutions. Don't like the war? Let's blame the president, Congress, or political lobbyists. Don't like ecological disregard? Let's blame this or that corrupt corporation or some regulatory body for poor performance. Don't like being poor and socially immobile? Let's blame government coercion and interference in this free market utopia everyone keeps talking about. 
The sobering truth of the matter is that the only thing to blame is the dynamic, causal unfolding of system expression itself on the cultural level. In other words, none of us create or do anything in isolation. It's impossible. We are system bound both physically and psychologically, a continuum. Therefore, our view of causality with respect to societal change can only be truly productive if we seek and source the most relevant sociological influences we can and begin to alter those effects from the root causes. And I don't know about you, but I am so sick of listening to 95% of the world's media, social critics, political parties, economic philosophers, so-called scientists, and yes, activist communities, as they continue wasting time and energy trying to patch a sinking ship that never had structural integrity to begin with. It isn't to say that we don't need such patches, okay? Because we are truly hemorrhaging from our wounds. But the level of embarrassment now upon us with respect to the hamster wheel of pointless acts must truly make for one hell of a reality show for the possible aliens watching our rather idiotic planet orbit into oblivion. The late great George Carlin once said, when you are born on this planet, you are given a ticket to the freak show. And if you're born in America, you are given a front row seat. It may be true that behind every cynic there is a failed idealist, but in a world where no good deed goes unpunished, it is easy to see how the most sensitive of the human condition can't help but suffer a kind of trauma of the spirit, where the childlike goodwill, curiosity, and rational development is stomped, suppressed, and destroyed by stubborn traditionalism forged by the supposed virtue of arrogant elitism. And yes, if you haven't figured it out, at the root of this series is not a light satirical view of modern life. It is a deeply frustrated and agitated expression that furthers in part my personal cathartic attempt to ward off the condition of simply not giving a shit anymore. And my hope is that those of you out there who can identify with this plight will begin to understand the seriousness of this societal struggle and work to help redeem this epidemic of intellectual belligerence known as the zeitgeist we endure. With that, I would like to thank all of you who have supported this show thus far, and perhaps we all may emerge to see a common human end in time, realizing that everything is you and you are everything. A spiritual responsibility of sorts, if you will, perhaps finally lifting us out of the dark age we wallow in today. My name is Peter Joseph, and perhaps you, like me, will no longer perceive yourself as a victim of a culture in decline, but rather as an agent of evolution, an agent of a culture in ascent. Pentagon has implemented its new strategy for global presence, Total Awareness Military Protocol Operational Network. <laughs>